instead of we sing along with the rock how about uh, a cody concert and he could come out and change the words to one of my favorite songs and say one rock feeds the fire roman <laughs> reigns lost his title cody's chips oh who's crying now or something like that rewind recap relive for over 50 episodes the revolutionary force in wrestling interviews my guest today is an absolute legend. He's been the third man in the ring for some of the best matches in wrestling history. And even cooler, he was living out his dream while doing it all. You can catch him now as one half of Reffin' It Up alongside Brian Hebner. Please welcome referee Jimmy Corderas. Well, thanks for having me. And don't let's not leave out RJ. My no. My friend RJ, who, like I always say, he holds the glue together, man. He's, he's awesome. No, he also is... introduced us. Yes. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's what I was about to say. No, thank you so much, RJ, for actually setting us and making it happen. I know that Reffin' It Up recently hit 100 episodes not too long ago, about a month ago. And that's awesome. I'd love to hear from you, though. How has it been catching up with old friends and being able to tell all those stories in the podcast form like that? It's been a blast, man. It's it, like you said, getting to catch up with guys you haven't talked to or seen for a while and just it, all the memories start coming back and you start yeah. thinking of the old stories and have a little fun with it as opposed to, you know, trying to dig deep and with some dirt and stuff like, which, you know, I get it. People want to hear some of that stuff, but I, I, I like having fun and it's fun catching up with those guys. It's awesome. Yeah. It seems like you always have a very positive outlook on everything, which is so cool. And like I said, you were living your dream while doing it all. Um, and to go into that, I did pick up your book, Jimmy, three count my life in stripes as a WWE referee unfortunately i'm not a fast reader but i've read some of it so far and it's it's amazing any wrestling fan out there should get it but also any dream changers because you really did accomplish that um how was that obviously it's a loaded question i'm sure the book took so long and it's over the course but if you were to sum that up for the dream chasers how would you how would you uh sell that book to somebody it was the dream come true for a guy who didn't expect it you know, a lot of people say my dream is to become a WWE superstar or, or a professional wrestler in one of the major companies or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I didn't have I was a huge fan from a kid. And when I grew up, when I became old enough to be able to travel to Maple Leaf Gardens here in Toronto, which is basically for those in the United States who aren't familiar with it, it is like Madison Square Garden North. OK, it is it is the Mecca in Canada for wrestling. And, you know. I, when I was old enough to be able to drive down myself, I would drive down and attend shows. And uh, one of my other hobbies was I loved taking pictures. So I would bring my camera with me and I'd get us. I ended up getting what was the equivalent of season's tickets. And it was right beside Maple Leaf Gardens was unique because it had this ramp leading from the dressing room, the locker room, the entrance room. They would enter into the arena and it was a few steps up and it was level with the ring all the way from the the entrance to the ring was a flat surface and i was right okay. beside that second row ringside right beside that so i was able to get some really good pictures yeah that's there. huge is it something kind of like tna had for a while where it's connected like the ring is connected to the stage on that long is it one of those platforms yeah it was just well, a straight platform that went as soon as they walked out of the locker room area they went up a couple of stairs and it was from there all the way to the ring and, you know, and when they fought outside the ring, you know, they do around the ring, but I don't, yeah. they'd also fight on the ramp, as we called it, oh, which was cool. kind of cool. And I'm taking pictures and I, you know, figured that we had a place up here in Canada called Direct Film. Mm -hmm. So I'd get the double your prints for a dollar. So I'd keep yeah. a set of prints for myself and I'd take the other set of prints and I'd go to the next show and sell them. And, you know, for two bucks a pop. Right which would fuel my wrestling habit. It would pay for it. You know what I mean? I was trying to, you know, I'd make a few bucks on the side. And the guy that worked for Jack Tunney at the time, Elio Zarlenga, he comes up to me one day. I didn't know who he was. And he says, hey, uh, you got some pictures there? I said, yeah. He says, can I look at them? Sure, here you go. He says, how much are they? I said, they're two bucks a pop. He says, you can't do that. I said, pardon me? I said, pardon me? He says, yeah, you're, you're not allowed to do that. I said, why? He says, it's copyright. He's going through this whole thing. He's, yeah. I work for Jack Tunney and I take the photos for the program, the Stranglehold magazine that they used to sell at the gardens. And I'm like, oh boy, am I in trouble now? He says, okay, you don't seem like a bad guy. I'll tell you what. 
just don't do it right outside Maple Leaf Gardens. Just go down the block a little bit and do it there where you're out of sight from everybody. Well, that's then, nice. <laughs> no, he was cool. Then I'd run into him at every show and he, you know, we, we struck up a friendship and he said, you know what? Let me talk to Jack and see if I could bring you on board as a photographer. You can come in ringside and help me take pictures and that sort of thing. So he introduced me to Jack Tunney and Jack Tunney says, well, we don't need another photographer, but we'll find something for the kid to do. And that's when I got hired on basically part time to for lack of a better term be the gopher whatever they needed done you know so yeah. that's that was my first step foot foot step into the business right and from there it evolved where oh. you know he would throw me the shoot me the keys to his fleetwood cadillac and say uh go to the airport and pick up andre the giant from the marriott or something right. like this you know hulk hogan's there go get him go get randy and liz whatever the case you know yeah <laughs> so i'm like uh, inside i'm going oh crap i'm going to go pick up you know hogan and all these guys andre the giant my goodness but i had to try and yes sir yes boss no problem right. <laughs> keep it inside yeah what yeah. what is the timeline like from when you start taking those pictures to when you're picking up someone like andre the giant okay uh so i started taking pictures around i want to say the right when before wwf at the time had kind of taken over the territory because at that time uh, the Tunnies who ran the Toronto Air Office, as they called it, you know, they borrowed talent from everybody. Okay. Back from uh, Vince Senior, you know, ba Backlund would come into the show. Nick Bockwinkle would come in and defend the AWA Championship, but most of the talent was coming from Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling from the Carolinas, and that's when I was, you know, really hooked on to get. Uh, I was I I idolized Ricky Steamboat. He was one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. You know, guys like Wahoo McDaniel, of course, Ric Flair. Greg Valentine, the, you know, Jimmy Snooker before he went to WW. Oh my goodness. It was great talent. So superheroes. When I started, when I started with Jack, it was 1985. Okay. And every three weeks they would run Maple Leaf Gardens, but on the Mondays after they would run the Brantford Civic Center, which Brantford, Ontario is about hour, 20 minutes outside Toronto, where they would tape three weeks worth the wrestling challenge. So they would run Maple Leaf Gardens every three weeks on the Monday after we do, they do three weeks of wrestling challenge tapings. Okay. So I would have to, you know, I'd have one of the minivans as they, well, not minivans, mini buses. <laughs> and Elio would drive the other mini bus. One of us would take the heels. One of us would take the baby faces and we'd alternate every week. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and that's just so cool. shuttle the guys back and forth. And I remember one time this was, this is the coolest thing ever. I'm, I'm taking all the, the managers and stuff. So sitting shotgun with me is classy Freddie Blassie. Sitting behind me is Bruno San Martino and Lou Albano. You know, Mr. Fuji's in the van. Gorilla Monsoon's in the van. Oh, I'm my going, God. And while I'm, drying, I'm try, driving, I'm trying to, okay, you got to keep it together here. Stay on the road. But look at this thing. And, you know, the guys are really cool. They were they were very, very friendly. Bruno, then Bruno pipes up. And I I'd, I'd met Bruno a few times and hello, how are you? Nice to see you, sir. And all that sort of stuff. But he struck up a conversation with me this one time. And I'm like, well, this is cool. Bruno's actually asking about me, wants to know about me. Oh, when did you start working for Jack and all this sort of stuff? He says, would you like some advice? I said, yes, sir. I would love some. He said, get out. I said, <laughs> pardon me? Just get out of the business. I said, uh, why? He says, once it gets in your blood, it'll never leave you. And he was right. Wow. That is so cool, though. So so quickly from you as a fan to to the evolution of that. But <laughs> great advice though from Bruno. But good thing you didn't listen, though. Really, no, good I'm, listen. I'm glad I didn't listen. If there's one time you you know you always listen, you as they say in the business, you be a sponge. You learn all the time from everyone. That was the one time I didn't take advice, and I said that was a good call. <laughs> that was a very good call. I'm curious, what were some of the early photos you took before he caught you doing what you were doing? Did you have favorite photos? Oh, I, I got some of Ric Flair on the ramp, uh, nice. Dusty Rhodes, mm -hmm. uh, the Boogie Woogie Man, J Handsome Jimmy, Jimmy Valiant. Man. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Uh, little Ed, Roddy Piper, when they were all Mid-Atlantic Territory guys, you know, Steamboat and Youngblood. Got some great photos. It's just, now I got to go dig them out. I can find out where. <laughs> that was where my next is. question. Do you yeah. still have these photos? Oh, they're around the house. I just have to do some uh, spring cleaning and find them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, don't we all? That's cool, though. I love I that. got a bunch on my phone, though, which is actually Oh, cool. cool. You that put I them found. on your yeah. phone. That's better. I'm trying to. I'm, it, when I find them, I do. 
Yeah, I, I have to thank the missus for that because she finds them all. <laughs> um, so I've heard you say that you're really learning on the job when it did come time to uh, refereeing and they really just threw you out there. After now being such a seasoned official that you are, when you look back to that first match, what are some things that come to mind that uh, maybe you could have done differently? Oh, one thing I could have done differently differently was ask what I was supposed to do before I got into the ring because it was very on the spot. Uh, Pat Patterson was the one who suggested to Jack, hey, you know what? We've got the kid here. Why don't we make him a referee? We'll use him during the show because he's waiting for stuff to do. Mm -hmm. and jack's first jack's reaction was uh yeah but do we want to smarten the kid up and pat's like he's in the locker room with the boys kind of hanging out he kind of knows what's going on let's use them yeah so he told me to get black sneakers black pants a blue shirt and a black bow tie carry it with me at all times because you never know when it's going to happen and chief j strongbow comes up one day at a show here in ontario and says he says, hey, uh, Jimmy Jam. He, that's, that was his nickname for me. J Jimmy Jam, you got your ref gear with you? I said, yeah, Chief, I do. He says, put it on, you're reffing tonight. I said, okay. I didn't want to say, but I've never reffed a match before, you know? Right. And I did, wasn't, didn't think enough to ask, start asking the guys, okay, if I get asked to ref, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? So he says, you're reffing SD Jones versus uh, Jose Luis Rivera was wearing the mask at the time as the Red Demon. Okay. And good thing I was good friends with SD, and I just went up and I said, SD, uh, I got some good news and maybe some bad news for you. I'm reffing your match tonight. He said, that's great. I said, I've never reffed a match before. He says, just stay close to me, listen to me, I'll talk you through it, which he did. Thank goodness for that. And that's when the light bulb went off, and I said, okay, it's time for me to start asking the other veteran referees you know, to watch my matches, tell me what I'm doing right, tell me what I'm doing wrong, and... I had some great mentors over the years from both Hebner brothers, uh, Earl and the late great Dave, God rest his soul. Yeah. Uh, Timmy White, uh, you name it. I had some great, great guys to work with, but it's not just the re referees. It's also the wrestlers too. They help you as well. And I had some great advice from, man, I sat under some great learning trees. I, what can I tell you? No, oh, I mean, and it definitely showed such a tenured referee that you are. Um, and legend, you really are. You've been through so many awesome moments in the business. Thank you. Uh, I, I had, that, yeah, that means a lot. No, that means a lot. Thank you. No, and it, and it's so true too. Like just and growing up, I wa I feel like I grew up to a lot of those big matches. We'll get to it, but like the feud mm -hmm. that got me into wrestling was actually Undertaker and Edge. So you oh. were in the middle of that one, and I definitely yeah. want to get into it. I've heard it's your favorite match refereeing, but I had Teddy Long on this show. A while ago and he told a really funny story of when it, he similarly got thrown in as i'm sure you know into the ring refereeing mm -hmm. um and his first match one of his first matches was a, a death match and i forget who the competitors were but he said that i guess he wasn't smartened up right away and he he ran out of the ring as soon as he saw them them bleeding and and just really you know beating each other hard and he left and i wish i might have been blackjack that I, he and he but one of them was like oh man the ref just left us and I, I thought it was such a funny story though of like him being in there right in the beginning on the fly did you ever have any brutal matches right away that kind of you know surprised you because you didn't maybe grow up in the industry um trying to think back it's hard to think but at that time it was a different style as you know it was more it, not the stuff you see today that I hate to put it this way because you know I want I, I, I don't want to tear down. I love, I want to help everybody build up. I want the industry to grow as a whole. But back then, the guys made it look real, for lack of a It looked like a real fight at times. I mean, yes, guys did some magnificent moves and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, when you saw, you mentioned Blackjack Mulligan, when you saw Blackjack throw a punch, you went, ooh, right. that looked like it connected. When you, uh, even later on, when you saw, jbl throw that clothesline from hell oh my god it, it looked like it decapitated the guy nearly and the the art of it is it looked like he did but very rarely if ever did he ever hurt anybody it looked that good and he was so good at delivering it and the guy taking it has to it's it's a it's a give and take it takes two yeah and back in the day like you had guys that looked like they they pass the airport test. When they walk through the airport, you look at them and go, I don't want to mess with this guy. You know what I mean? 
Absolutely. So it, it is a completely different style, but I know what Teddy's talking about because there were times where we had guys like uh, Umaga. Oh, my and, God. <laughs> uh, and uh, One Man Gang. So, th- of course, the referee's supposed to be the law and order in the ring, but it, you have to show a little bit of trepidation around those guys and you have to kind of calculate when's the time to run and when's the time to just back off. That was the, that was the uh, the question there, and then the Undertaker came along, and you said, "Okay, this is time to go." <laughs> <laughs> Give him a lot of leeway. No, definitely. Yes. And on the on the topic of standing out, the airport test, you said that you'd go pick up Andre the Giant, for example, and. Mm-hmm. I mean, Andre is just such, obviously, speaks for itself, his reputation. But being around him so early on, um, what do you have any stories that come to mind of Andre the Giant that, that peak oh, out? Oh, my goodness. Oh, where do I begin? Um, <laughs> I remember, you know, the, Andre's the kind of guy, if he took a liking to you, you were in. Hmm. And he's also the kind of guy, if he offered you a drink, you never said no. You always- Andre... <laughs> Andre would hold a bottle of wine and he'd hold it. Those hands were so big. You couldn't see the label on the damn thing. And he'd drink that like a, like a bottle of beer. <laughs> I mean, that's not legitimately. And uh, I remember one time when I got sent to the airport to pick him up, Timmy White wasn't accompanying him on this trip. Cause he usually, usually accompanied uh, Andre on, you know, help him get around. Cause he couldn't drive. Right. He couldn't get behind the wheel of a car and stuff like that. So uh i want to say it was danny davis who was accompanying on this trip and he you know jack said go pick up andre and you know bring him down if you can and i said sure so i go up to the airport and i call his room and there's no answer and i called danny's room and i said uh, uh boss isn't in his room do you know where he might be he says i'll go check the bar i'll be down in about five ten minutes i go okay so i went to the bar there he was and he goes hey jimmy come in and sit down have a drink and i figured um i'm driving but one one drink it ain't gonna be bad one drink turned to four <laughs> because <laughs> like I said, you can't refuse. And I'm going, Oh, well, you know, maybe I got to call it quits here. Hopefully Danny yeah. shows up soon. You know, <laughs> he comes down and he says, Danny looks at me, he goes, want me to drive? I said, it wouldn't be a bad idea, but if we show up and you're driving, uh, that doesn't look good for me for in front of the boss, you know? Yeah. So, you know, carefully, he, Danny sat beside me, you know, carefully took your time and went down there and, and I dropped him off and, I went to give Jack his keys back, and I said, uh, here you go, boss. And he goes, thank you, Jimmy. He says, Jimmy, come here for a second. And he looked at me, gave that look. He said, were you drinking? Have you been drinking? And I kind of got, I didn't say answer. I did. I just went, you know, shrugging my shoulders kind of. Yeah. Uh, he says, was Andre in the bar when you're going to go pick him up? And, I, you know, you don't never rat out the boys, right? You, I went. Mm. <laughs> and he goes, I just go in my office, have a couple of coffees, and you'll be fine. So he was cool about it. Wow. I guess he understood, <laughs> it happened he understood before, the situation. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess. But, uh, I, he was very understanding. Jack was cool. Jack yeah. was cool. I love Jack. That's awesome. Um, well, you have, like I said, a lot of incredible moments. One in particular that I wanted to ask about is I heard you were able to be part of the first ever Royal Rumble. Um, yes which is awesome. We've seen how big it's become since what was, but what went into it in its inception, like the planning of something so monumental at the time. It was interesting because there wasn't much really for the referees to do, except keep an eye on things outside the ring and make sure, you know, if somebody takes a bad bump outside, they're okay. Yeah. So the planning that goes on is mostly with the boys, who's going to get eliminated when, and the timing of it. And that was the creation of Pat Patterson, that uh, the Royal Rumble. And the first one was here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. When you pronounce any city in Canada, you have to add the Canada at the end. You know, it's yeah. city, city, province, and then country. It, it's just the way it is, as we know, with Brett the Hitman Hart from Calgary, yes. Alberta, Canada. Thank you have God to put that we in got there. that into our brain. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for the first one, there wasn't a lot there to take in. But as the Royal Rumble became a more prominent uh event in wwe history now the more planning got into it we had to be more aware of what was going on you know this this felt like it was going to be a one-off maybe it'll happen again but people took to it so well that it ended up becoming its own pay-per-view and one of the big fours yeah so so it was kind of a cool moment to be a part of the first one like being a part of the first survivor series as well you know that was kind of cool down in cleveland yeah what did that feel like to you seeing all of these kind of um 
I don't know, uh, stipulations, but bigger, you know, these match types come about like right when you were there, like that must've been a cool feeling see like the Survivor Series tag team at the Royal yeah. Rumble, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was absolutely cool. And, you know, I got to do the women's match inside the ring because the Royal, the Survivor Series, the first one, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Do they still do it nowadays when they have the multi-person teams where there's a referee inside and one outside the ring? And I'm not 100% oh, you know what? sure in that. I don't know if there's one outside these days. I know they definitely right. multi man. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, in the first one, that's the way they did it. And for the for the big one with uh, Team Andre versus Team Hogan, I was the outside referee, and Joey Morella was the inside referee, and or as Gorilla used to call us, the twins, because we I had more hair <laughs> back then, so we kind of looked a lot alike. And you know, it was, it was I'm like there was one spot where I had to jump in the ring and help separate Andre and Hogan, and I'm like. This is incredible. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I'm, you know, here I am, you know, just my first year in, and I'm standing between Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan inside a ring. Right. You, you got to be freaking kidding me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the long way from taking pictures, right? At the Maple Leaf. Oh, yeah. No kidding. No kidding. That is so awesome. Uh, fast forwarding, still on the topic of Royal Rumble, when you're standing in between two other people, 2005, John Cena, batista and you i don't know how you and the other officials were able to do that on the fly i've heard so many stories surrounding it but i still i, I still feel like you guys did a great job concealing it because i don't really know if, like what happened can you take us through that yeah. and and yeah the pressure yeah i'm gonna peel back the curtain a little bit here on this one if you don't mind but right. okay the finish didn't go off as originally planned so it was john cena and batista the last two in the ring they were both going to go over the top dave was going to hang on to the top rope john was going to hit the floor dave wins the royal rumble right. they go on to wrestlemania to face the champion unfortunately you know during the course of that match that top rope can get really wet from all the sweat uh, that's on it dave couldn't hang on he just slipped right off and you couldn't time it any better that they both hit the floor at the same time. They just, it was like, almost like they, they wanted to do it that way. Exactly. But it, it just, yeah. but it just happened that way. So, you know, because Dave was supposed to go over and he was a Raw superstar and, and John Cena was a SmackDown superstar, one of the Raw referees, I think it was Jack Doan, went over and raised Dave's hand instinctively because that was the finish originally scheduled. And we got it, you know, we wore the IFBs, the earpiece, and one, J Gerald Briscoe says, one of the SmackDown refs go out there and raise John Cena's hand. So I it's, ran right over as soon as I could, and, we, and Charles and I were like, no, he's the winner. And we started the arguing back and forth. No, he's right. the winner, he's the winner. While this is going on, we could hear, again, in our IFBs, them calling for the other refs in the back, find the respective general managers, Teddy Long and Eric Bischoff. Because they wanted them to come out and get into an argument to do the deal where they continue the match the, the, with the two competitors until we find a winner. Apparently, they decided they wanted to skip the uh, miss the traffic and skipped out a little early. And when Vince came out, wow. when Vince came out to the back, we we know the Mr. McMahon character. This wasn't Mr. McMahon character. This was a PO'd Vince. <laughs> And we were, oh, oh, what's going on here? And he's coming out and he's throwing his jacket down. And when he dives under the bottom rope into the ring, he falls back on his ass. And we were wondering, okay, he's not getting back up. What the hell's going on? So he's going, he's like, come over here. God damn it. And he's screaming. So we're getting instructions. And then, you know, make the match continue. And he's giving us the instructions there as the authority figure. So they continued the match and went to the proper finish where Batista eventually eliminated Cena. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know at the time that Vince had torn both quads. And when some they tried to help him after he rolled out under the box, tried to help him. Yeah. He refused help. He didn't want anybody touching him. What? And he made it to the back on his own with two <laughs> torn quads. So if anybody questions his toughness, okay. You know. Yeah. Uh, I know he's the name that we shouldn't be talking about right now, but I gotta tell you how it happened then. No, you, you have know, to, yeah. You know, so we got to the back and they said, you know, it looked like it was called on the fly, but there was a little bit of help. Thank goodness for those, uh, the evolution of the earpiece. Because it that when before we had that, we had to rely on the timekeeper at ringside to give us time cues with hand signals 
you know, when it was time to go home, he'd put the pencil in his mouth. Mm -hmm. and you'd have to look. So you occasionally would have to look over there. And the and, and the artistic part about it is to look over there without making it seem obvious that you're looking for a cue. Right. Like if there was a if there was a false finish, one, two, no, he kicked out. So you're looking at the timekeeper, kind of looking to get the cue from him while you're doing that. Or no, he doesn't quit, you know, or something, whatever you're doing. Yeah. But yeah, those those earpieces were both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! And I still it, can't believe that it that it came off as great as it did. Honestly, on TV, it almost, yeah, it almost feels like it was, you know, scheduled to go that way. Yeah, it does. Almost feels perfect. And I want to segue with that <laughs> into a question, a story I heard um, that you helped Mister Perfect come up with the name for his finisher. Yes, uh, is that yeah? Can you tell us the story behind that? Because I think that's so interesting. Well, this was when he he came in as Mr. as Kurt Henning when he first came into the WWF at the time, yeah. and he evolved into the Mr. Perfect character. And as he had having a match at Maple Leaf Gardens, I was standing beside Jack Lanza as we were watching the match from the curtain. You know that you could see the ring. They didn't have monitors in the back at, during house shows at the time, so you know we're just watching the match, watching the match, and you know he did he did the fisherman suplex to the bridge. Mm -hmm as his finisher and he got to the back and jack you know offered is yeah that was a good match it's a good match but vince wants you to come up with a name for your finish he says okay i'll come up with something and if for i don't know why it just clicked right there i said jack and i have a suggestion if you don't mind he says sure what is it i said how does perfect plex go he says kurt we got your new name we got the name for your finish right there <laughs> it just sometimes it's, things pop in your head I'll give yeah. you another example, if you don't mind. Of course. Yeah. Uh, one time, do you remember the supermarket brawl with Stone Cold Steve Austin? Oh, yes, and yes. Booker T. Absolutely. So they had filmed that earlier in the day. That's when SmackDown was taped in the day. And they were doing their thing. And I was standing beside Paul Heyman, who was head of creative for SmackDown at the time. And we're watching this thing. And we're laughing and going, this is this is awesome. This stuff is great. You know, Steve going off on him and Booker selling his ass off and it's just fun stuff. And he's covered in flour and milk and, you know, everything you can think of. And he puts him on the conveyor belt at the cash out and he gives a few, gives him a few parting shots and he starts walking out. And as he's walking out, I'm standing beside Paul. Oh, I got my arms folded like this. And I just went, tried to do my best Steve Austin voice. Price check on a jackass. <laughs> Wait. And Paul looks at me and goes, what'd you say? And I thought he was hot. I said, uh, price check on a jackass? He says, why weren't you in the meeting? <laughs> and next <laughs> thing you know, when I watched it back on, on Thursday night at the time, they had VO'd it in. They dubbed so, it in afterwards with Steve's okay. voice. With Steve's voice. When you because just he was that? Yeah, because he was yeah. walking away. Mm -hmm. Sorry, he was walking away in the oh. shot, so you couldn't see him saying it. And they did it in a way where it sounded like he was walking out of the shot. So... And I'm going, that's cool, man. <laughs> that's really cool, actually, because when you were just telling that story, I thought you were going to say that it's your voice in there at the end, like you were off camera or something and said that, because I remember that's such an iconic way to finish it. I remember, I don't know if you watch uh, Maven's YouTube channel that's been getting a lot of traction recently, but they just did a, he and Booker T did a watch along of that supermarket moment oh. and they mentioned that at the end that price check on a jack of maven was like that's a fantastic way to end it great line so that's so yeah. cool yeah that I, you know I, other one other um, i know i'm taking a lot of time here but no. one other thing that sometimes you just say something offhand that clicks with somebody and somebody goes hmm but the, the referee scab angle for example that that wasn't originally scheduled to have me be a schedule uh, scab referee that happened purely by coincidence okay. i had um i had just gotten married it was september 5th 1999 i remember specifically but before it, going uh getting married and going on our honeymoon i went to jr and i said look you know i'd like to take a couple of weeks if i can then you know to have a honeymoon maybe two weeks if that's cool he said yeah absolutely sure no problem while i was away unbeknownst to me they started this this the referees strike yeah where the referees went on strike protesting the fact that they were being abused too often and that sort of thing. But I wasn't watching any wrestling when I was away. You know, I was on my honeymoon. I want to stay married. I wasn't going to watch wrestling. <laughs> you know? so, so, so I get back and they're, they're, 
the guys are bu buzzing me, filling me in on this. And, you know, everybody say, hey, how was the honeymoon? Welcome back, all this. And I run into Hunter. And he used to call me Corduroy. Hey, Corduroy, how was the wedding? Was it fun? How does it feel to be out of a job? Ha, ha, ha. And I said, are you? I'm, no, I can't afford to go on strike. <laughs> I just got married. And he went, ha, 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 come with me. So he took me and he took me to create. He says, hey, Jimmy had a great idea. And I'm thinking, what idea did I have? <laughs> Oh, so they talked about it and they said, okay, you're going to be the scab referee. You're going to be the only regular referee who doesn't go on strike. Wow. And then that led to that six pack challenge where the other refs came in and beat the living tar out of me. By the yes. way, Mike Kyoto, I still owe you a few receipts, but anyways. <laughs> he laid it in. Well, yeah, yeah but the, here's the problem. He, lay, he, I had my back to him and he was kicking me down low in the butt so hard. I just like, I almost crapped myself. I'm like, dude, he's up, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh that is that's so funny that i can't believe these things just happen right and it's it's so authentic too maybe that's what makes it so memorable is that it's just you know not planned right you just say it or you, you say the right thing yeah um, and it's a it's an offhanded remark that sparks someone in some something in someone else like yeah uh one more example please I'm not 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 to do the barry horowitz i'm patting yeah, myself <laughs> on the back here but um uh batista undertaker in the cage Mm -hmm. when they had their match on, uh, so the the ending of the match was them dropping down at the same time I was inside the ring Mickey Henson was outside now of course when they're dropping down on opposite sides of the ring you can't see who drops first right so I'm looking at I'm looking one way Mickey's looking at the other way and they say okay the guys are going to drop down at the same time and Mickey you and Jimmy are going to Try and discuss it trying to figure it out and you can't come to a conclusion so basically it'll be a draw i said yeah too bad nobody has a red flag to throw out. we can go to a replay he said again somebody says hold on a sec here hold on is there any way we can work this out so they say okay at the end you guys go to the table where michael cole and jbl are sitting and ask them you, you ask them you want to see the replay it the truck to replay it on the mon on their monitor so we can watch it back and they did it so perfectly where they landed at the same time. And it, they got the same result where the match was yeah. declared a draw. But they, we incorporated something different, you know, so, which was kind of cool. So I'm, That is really I'm, cool. I don't, I don't know if I'm the only one ever to do it, but I think we were the first. I've, I'm the first referee in, in professional wrestling to utilize instant replay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. What's, I know you, it seems like it could never, uh, never work its way into the match for some reason on the science of refereeing. Another thing you talked about the other referees, you know, beating the tar to you, like you said, but in general, a ref bump, I feel like it's such a different bump. Like I watch how a referee bumps an extra wrestler. And I, I can assume that's intentional, but I'd love to hear in your opinion about bumping as a referee. What is it? Uh, what, what does it entail for it to go well, down? Well, 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 for uh, my philosophy is as far as referee bumps are, Unless it's a big move, the first bump I ever took on television was One Man Gang 747. So there's no way you you can differentiate that from how the boys take it because there's only one way to take it. He lifts you up like a suplex and he drops you flat down. But if you're taking a clothesline and you flat back, then you look like you're trained to take a bump. Referees shouldn't look like they could take a bump like the boys. They should. It should look a little awkward, but at the same time, try to protect yourself as best as you can. Yeah. But but again, not look like you've been trained to wrestle and take bumps. The, that's the unique art of it, in my opinion. If you start taking and not flip flop around too much either, because I've seen sometimes referees will take a bump and they're too, they're all jittery and they look <laughs> like they're having seizures and spasms. I'm going, yes, no, man, <laughs> you just took you took whatever from this guy. You're down. Sell. You know, uh, yeah, but that's my philosophy. Don't bump like you're one of the wrestlers. That's a great philosophy, I think. Yeah, and it was always I don't know, maybe this is uh, yeah, it, it was like satisfying, not satisfying to see you guys in pain, but to see a referee like fall in a different way than the wrestler, it looked mm -hmm. as a viewer like, oh wow, yeah, that that's different. Like I can tell he's not a wrestler, you know. No, it should look natural. Natural is maybe a better yes. word. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, Another thing on the science of refereeing are the counts. I'm curious how you came up with your style of count and 
really just yeah if if it if different referees styles of counting helps the competitors in different ways with things like near falls well once once talent gets comfortable with your cadence then they know the proper times to kick out and your cadence needs to be consistent throughout the match and i know it's hard to do it because i've i've had times where it's hard for me to do because as the match progresses and the excitement level you know elevates your excitement level does too so you have to be cognizant of the fact that you know, i don't want to get too amped up and start counting too fast and, and speed up my cadence keep it the same throughout so that the guys know exactly when and where they can kick out especially if you want to make it a near fall right you know as close as possible keep the cadence consistent as best as you can and you know, we have uh, i've seen you know instances where uh, at the finish, it's too a little faster mm -hmm. or a little slower, and for me, that's a dead giveaway. Yeah, that it's you know, I, yeah. So try try to keep it as consistent as possible. There's other things that I see that I don't want to mention because um, they're for me a dead giveaway that it's not the finish. Some referees have a tell, oh, okay. and maybe it's because maybe it's because. I've been doing it for so long that I notice it and I don't want to tell people because once you see it, you can't unsee it. I, I did it to, with my wife, <laughs> as a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I mentioned it to her and she goes, Oh, there it is. That is, she knows when it's the finish now. Yeah. When certain referees are in the ring. <laughs> so she never has to watch those matches ever again. She could just say, I know exactly who's going to win. Exactly. When we used to do a show up here called aftermath uh, on, on Sportsnet, it was a televised post show that we used to do once a week up here okay. um we went to SummerSlam here in toronto in 2009 2019 okay and i was sitting with the producer uh, after we had shot all our stuff for the show in the backstage and all that sort of stuff so we're sitting we're watching the matches and i'm not going to give out the referee's name because i don't want to show you know i don't want to throw anybody under the bus but uh he has he had a tell and, you know, the producer goes, oh, I thought that was it. I, he, and I went, eh. He goes, yeah, but you know the finish. And I said, no, I don't know what the finish is to this match. I wasn't in the room. I don't know. I just know that this wasn't that wasn't going to be the finish. Then there was another really good false finish. But I because of the tell, I can I knew it wasn't. The crowd bit, yeah. but I could see it. You could and see he goes, it. And he says, how did you know it wasn't the finish? I said, I don't want to tell you because if I tell you, then you won't be able to unsee it. So he says, no, just tell me. So I said, okay, uh, here you go. James, this is what it is. So now when it happened, he goes, you're right. I can't unsee it now. And I said, that's why I don't want to give it away. Because once you give it away, you, you know, you can peel back the curtain a little bit, but I don't want to break that wall down. No. At times. No, James ruined it for himself. Now, whenever he watches yeah, yeah. the match with that referee. Yeah, he knows. He knows. Yeah, it's no, it's really, it ruins the magic a little bit. I could definitely see that, mm -hmm. uh, especially mm -hmm. if you could catch on to it well. On the other side of it, as a referee for so long, who do you think are some of the best near fall kickout artists that you've seen, of wrestlers that uh, oh. have that talent, I, whether it be today or in your time? Oh, my goodness. Where do we Trying to think. Randy Orton comes to mind. Mm. Randy is the most complete wrestler I think out there right now. I mean, I know you can make an you can make an argument for a lot of guys. You can make an argument for Will Osprey. You can make an right. argument for other other talents, magnificent talents. Out there. There's a lot of guys out there that can go, but there is nobody that is smooth and as realistic and ticks all the boxes, even from a character standpoint, like Randy Orton. Yeah. He's one. Uh, believe it or not, Taker is one. Oh, totally. Taker's kid. You know, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because when you think somebody's finally got him, and he, and then after the kick out, the sit-up, it just adds so much more to it. It's just incredible. Um, you know who is good at it? Ray. Ray Mysterio. Oh, because yeah? such a because of the size difference and that underdog feel you had in this, him having to overcome bigger opponents that he was also another one, Eddie, mm. you know, man, there, there were a lot of good ones. That's a, that's a good question. It's tough though. That's a, yeah. I watching um, a lot now I'm I, Roman Reigns comes to mind for me, but 
You're good call. Yes. Good call. yes. Yeah. Yeah. The that way he gets like thing. he like lifts his arm, then it just immediately goes dead. Like right after he kicks out, there's something about it that mm -hmm. suspense. Yeah. Because he's continuing to sell, and it was like a desperation move. Mm, yeah. Because he, like he's aware the count is coming, he desperately gets that shoulder up, and then he falls back down. You know, looks great. No, for sure. Well. To move in now to your favorite match you ever refereed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's Edge versus Undertaker, WrestleMania 24. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing I want to know about that is what is it like being in the ring when the Undertaker makes his entrance on the grandest stage of them all, WrestleMania? It's a it's a spectacle anywhere, but at that particular at WrestleMania, that whole with the whole lights going down and yeah. that shadow showing up in the stage and you're watching it from down low in the ring and you're going i can't believe i'm here right and i can't believe this guy's going i'm going to be in the ring with this guy who was our locker room leader and for those who don't know he didn't appoint himself the rock the locker room leader he was chosen by the locker room as our leader wow. and to be in there with him and to be in there with a guy like edge who hometown buddy of mine uh, you know the, for him it was like he said full circle having me referee his main event match at wrestlemania when he was at the sky dome at wrestlemania 6 watching me referee in the ring when he was a kid in the crowd i did you know and i'm that's and i'm like this is the coolest moment ever and i wasn't originally scheduled to referee that match oh wow I about a week before because yeah um i was more or less kind of designated as the the TLC ladder match kind of referee because they were confident with having me out there when these guys were doing those big spots and that sort of thing to kind of keep an eye on things and make sure everything was okay. But the week before WrestleMania, I want to say it was Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, Edge comes up and he says, hey, Jimmy, how you doing? I said, good, man. How you doing? Edge? He says, I'm good. He says, um, by the way, T Taker and I were talking. We're going to talk to the office. We want you to referee our match at WrestleMania. And I said, oh, really? That's cool. Says, yeah, don't worry, we'll get it done. You're going to be there. And I'm like, wow. So I'm walking down the hall and I run into Taker. He said, hey, uh, Jimmy, did Edge talk? I said, yeah, he did. He says, are you cool with that? I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, like, uh, am I cool with that? Yeah. Of course I'm cool with that. Are you, <laughs> you guys okay know. with it? <laughs> are you guys cool with it? And so they, of course, got to change because, you know, Taker has a say in what he does and so does Edge. And and then we went into WrestleMania the day before, got in the green room and sat down. And Michael P.S. Hayes was the agent slash producer for the match. And they were running over the match. And, um, you know, and they're looking at me. Jimmy, are you good with that? Yeah, I'm fine with this. I'm fine with that. And then P.S. says, Jimmy, we want to bump you in this match where we take you out of the match and have to bring in a second referee. Are you OK with that? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. No worries. Whatever you want. And then Taker looks at me. He says, Jimmy, are you OK with taking a big boot? And I said, absolutely. I said, yeah. and I'm thinking in my head, this is freaking Undertaker asking me if I'm okay to take a big boot. Take, bring it. Bring I will it. take it any day of the week. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so uh, we went there. But the night before, man, that night, I couldn't get to sleep. I was so amped up. I, I find myself at like 2.30 in the morning walking outside the hotel, having a seat and just sitting up and... Thank goodness I ran into Ken Anderson outside because he was able oh, to, nice. Jimmy, what's up? It's late, man. He said, yeah, I'm just, I'm anxious. I don't know. I'm nervous, anxious and all this, and I can't get to sleep. He says, what are you nervous about? I said, you know, I'm doing the match tomorrow. It's the main event. And I want, it's, I'm not worried about me. I just want to be there for the guys. I don't, I don't want to mess anything up. I just want to make sure that I do what I need to do for them because the referee's job is to be, the conduit that helps them tell their story. The referee is never the story. You're just part of a part, a piece to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Trying to spit these words out sometimes is hard. It's very Especially hard. Especially now for a guy who's supposed to be talking for a living. But anyway. <laughs> so, you know, he said, no, Jimmy, man, let me ask you something. Are you, are you confident in your work? I said, yeah, I am. He says, you got this. Don't worry about it, man. Go get some rest. You'll be fine. He can help, you know calm me down which was really cool of him and i got i still haven't thanked him enough for it but Aww. so you know it's just a little thing that not only do wrestlers feel a little bit of anxiety those referees who do care 
like uh, I care. Yeah. And again, it's not about me. It's not about getting my myself over and getting noticed and stuff like that. It's about being there for the talent and being there for them because that's my job to help them tell their story. Yeah. Absolutely. And and that kid inside of you too, that was like I said, back at Maple Leaf Garden now is going into WrestleMania, 70 plus thousand people. Like no, no worries about you know being ex- like uh nervous or anything like that of course like that's expected i want to ask a certain moment so you take that big boot in the match and then we see a mm-hmm. very notable run down to the ring from charles yes Hogan. iconic run down i know you're on the floor i believe when that's yes happened, but do you yes. hear anything in your earpiece about that or do you talk to him about it after what do you think about that no i i watched it after i didn't get to see it unfortunately because uh, I, like you said i rolled off i was under the apron and then edge said i'm going to come over and gu- try to grab you like i'm going to try and pull you back and but you roll to the floor that way you're taken out of the match and i just laid there and I'm laying there and I'm listening to everybody and I'm trying to sell. And I'm thinking to myself, don't move until they come and get you. Don't move until they come and get you because I'm so amped up right now. Yeah. You know, and then I hear the crowd roar and Charles did that slide under the bottom rope like no one else could have slid into perfect position to make that count, which are, which is one of the best false finishes you'll ever see. And it was just awesome. and. Real funny side note, the, the day before when we were in a green room talking about it, and they said afterwards, Jimmy, after we take you out of the match, we need a second referee to come down. Who who should we get? And it's like everybody looked at each other at the same time, kind of paused a moment, and everybody went, Charles. Because <laughs> he's the only one who could make that 75-yard run in the, to the ring without oh getting God. gassed up and blown up. <laughs> I Charles thought it was, was incredible that he was able yeah. to slide in and still have the energy. He was all there. No, because Charles was one of those guys that used to jog and get his, you know, he, he had a great uh, stamina. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And we figured, you know, everybody else, uh, you know, would have to stop halfway and have a cigarette before they got <laughs> to the ring. And stuff. So, you know, Charles was the guy. Yeah. And as we saw, he was the right choice. Yeah. No, absolutely. And as such a mind for the business that you are, I'm curious because there was rumors that the streak was going to end that year. Of course, we know it ended years later um, at WrestleMania 30. But do you think the streak, just loaded question, of course, do you think the streak should have ever ended at all? Uh, there, first of all, like you said, there was a talk, and it came from Taker. He was the one who suggested that Edge be the one to end that streak. But Edge was the one who said, no, the streak has to continue. So they convinced him finally to you know, have Taker continue the streak. And it's easy to Monday morning quarterback after the fact, you know, yes, did it help Brock Lesnar? In a way it did, and in a way it didn't. Yeah. Uh, it helped him because they said, wow, here's the guy who ended the Undertaker's uh, WrestleMania winning streak, but at the same time, that pissed a lot of people off. Because I don't think they wanted to see it end. Yeah. And I think people were angry at Brock more than they were at the decision to have it end then. So, you know, Brock took the heat for it, and it kind of worked out in the end because it kind of made him a heel. Yeah, it did for so, a while too. Yeah, yeah, but at, but at the end of the day, uh, you you have someone who had such an iconic character, an iconic career. I almost feel like that was one streak that should have never been broken. I agree with you. I mean, it, it was, but all the things have to come to an end, I guess. And it was cool that Undertaker got to, it got to happen. Through, through a really hard hitting match, you know, when both guys could still, mm-hmm. could still kill it. Uh, that was the same WrestleMania. That was a big WrestleMania overall. Of course, we saw Rick oh. Flair and Shawn Michaels, but there yeah. was another match on that, that I remember I loved. Uh, I just rewatched it. Big Show and Floyd Mayweather. Such a unique match happening. I was curious if you have any uh, memories from that match, maybe backstage or anything, because I know you didn't, you wouldn't ref it, but any thoughts? No. On that? No, I tried to watch as much of it as I could, but like again, I was having such um anxiety. such an energy and anxiety over the match that I was scheduled to referee. I didn't really get to pay attention to a lot of the rest of the card. I was just trying to focus on maybe overly anxious, so to speak. Yeah. You know, but uh I, I wish I would watch more. Obviously I watched it back later, but I wish I, I had watched it at the time because 
I'm one of those people who like to watch it as it happens, as opposed to, you know, taping it and watching it later and that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, we live in a world where everything's PVR, you know, you can hit on your TV now record for later, you know? And, yeah, exactly. No, it's, it's really cool to watch it live. There's no feeling like it really, I don't know. It feels different when you're watching wrestling, especially wrestling live. Cause you're yes. Just, and now with like, social media how it just blows up with every moment i feel if almost like you're watching as a collective unit you know right no but you're right I, something like a like professional wrestling a hockey football it's like i'm going to tape the i'm going to tape the super bowl and watch it later you're gonna know by the time it you know you get to watch it you already know what's going to happen because yeah. it's all over the place you it's know? all so over it's one of those deals where you got to watch it live 100 percent. but now with how international wwe is going specifically with different events sometimes i can't watch it so early and my friend i have this friend mm -hmm. who we watch it consistently the pay-per-views together or the ple's and um sometimes you can so we just stay off of our it's the only time we're probably just completely yeah. unplugged because we're like we don't want to see a single spoiler wait till the next day at like i don't know noon or something come over and watch it then yeah, that was the unfortunate thing about Elimination Chamber in Australia that it exactly. wasn't uh, on the East Coast here. It was 5 a.m. when it started. And I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, dude. I can't get up that early. Um, <laughs> Where are you? I, I, I'm in Toronto. Toronto? Okay. Yeah. I'm in New Sorry, York. Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Yeah, I didn't know what you were talking <laughs> about. I was lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, heading into another WrestleMania. You were the fourth man in the ring for this one. Fourth man in the ring and all over the place. Uh, a WrestleMania that people call one of the greatest ever, if not the greatest, very much uh, argument can be made. Kane, Big Show, and Raven, hardcore yes. title. Yeah. I love this match so much. And I was wondering if you could just take us, peel the curtain back for that one, take us into, into anything you remember from that match. Oh, the, the biggest thing I remember is we almost lost power to the Astrodome that night. <laughs> when with uh big show jumping on the back of raven's the golf cart that raven had yes. uh, um procured and tried to escape <laughs> yeah. with and as he jumped on the back i guess nobody realized that he's so heavy that he pulled the steering wheel the two wheels in the front off the ground and that's what you steer the darn cart with so he crashed into a fence where the wires were running right beside it for like a stack of power cables were and everybody gasped. You could hear them gasp from where we were going, oh, Lord, I hope, you know. And then Big Show tried to pull it off after Raven ran down the thing. But then I got thrown on the back of a golf cart by Kane, and I got to get <laughs> chauffeured around for by Kane. So that was kind of a cool little deal. But then the finish came where they landed in that, that, that pit, pit yeah. beside, beside the uh, stage. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, where am I going to count this? So I asked. I said, where do you want me to count it? I can't jump in the pit with them, can I? Nobody will see it. They said, well, just stand on the outside and just hit the side of the... Slap the wall, yeah. Slap the wall, so that's what I did. And then later on that night, of course, we had the most, what people are still calling to this day, the best WrestleMania match ever, that TLC match with mm -hmm. the Dudleys, Edge and Christian, and the Hardys, which was off the charts. That Because was, yes. they... They did something so different and unique every time they had one of those matches. They because they from the first one they raised the bar. Yeah. And then every time they went in there, they raised that bar so much more. And that one was a topper. And everybody remembers when you talk about iconic moments, like 18 with Hogan and Rock, everybody talks about that. In this TLC match, everybody remembers Jeff Hardy hanging from that oh. center of the ring. And Edge spearing them in midair and them landing and incredible. And if you notice at the bottom of the screen on the right, try, I'm trying to stay out of the picture, but there was a ladder there. And I'm trying to scooch it over as much as I can so these guys don't land on it. <laughs> That's you just, incredible. Again, in, in one of those matches, my primary job is to check on the talent and make sure they not only get their times correctly when you can when you can relay them, but make sure that they are okay. Mm -hmm. What was it about you, do you think, that made you the TLC ref? Were you really good at checking on the talent after these insane spots, maybe? Or, or what do you think it was? Because you said like before that they really put you in a lot of those latter TLC matches. I think they had confidence in me to 
be aware of when to go check on the guys and when to stay out of the picture and that sort of thing. But I checked all the time. Yeah. When they could, you know, there was the one a TLC match where it, I think it was Bubba and, and Matt on this tall ladder inside oh the God. ring. Yeah. And they crashed through the four tables to the outside. And I ran over there like to make sure. And we have a little sign that we used to give them. It wasn't verbally. Obviously you're asking if they're okay, but old school wrestling is, they'll always say they're okay even when they're not so we would there's a little thing we used to do especially when there was like a head injury suspected where we would squeeze the fingers mm -hmm. and if your bell is rung you're not aware enough to squeeze back if they squeeze back then we knew they're okay if they didn't squeeze back then we're okay hold up back off give them a minute, then we're going to see where we're going to go. And now, it, it, thank God, they have ringside physicians and trainers and stuff like that who will assess the problem. You can call them over and they will check out the guys because we're not obviously trained medical staff. Right. So so you have to be aware of signals, signs and signals. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely. And I, I guess I guess they trusted me to to be there for the guys and make sure that everybody's okay, which is, you know, truly an honor. Yeah. And you got a front row seat to, like you said, one of the best, definitely the best TLC match ever, in my opinion, uh, but these insane mm -hmm. moments. So when I tell you Jeff Hardy is my favorite wrestler of all time, big Jeff Hardy fan. Mm -hmm. And of course, you mentioned that moment, the spear, which is incredible. But uh, just when you think Jeff Hardy, do any stories pop out other than the uh, the spear? No, just just that Jeff was such a cool guy. Both him and Matt, they were so easygoing. They, they were almost like the young bucks before the young bucks were, but <laughs> in a different if in a different way because, um, and this is not a knock on the young bucks at all. Don't get me wrong. When the young bucks were in their heyday, they were very much more spotty, for lack of a better term. Matt and Jeff got the idea of psychology in the ring very quick. And, and for young guys when they first started. And that's that was the main difference. I think right now, the Matthew and Nicholas that you're watching right now, yeah, get it. Because this thing they're doing with the EVP thing, and do and you see the ring style has completely changed. It it has, yeah. You know, they are they know what they're doing now, they get it. You don't have to do, and I have to do the, I have to say this every time I talk to somebody. They don't have to do a twisting, burning 450 hammer phoenix splash that somebody's going to kick out of anyway <laughs> just to get viral on the internet for five minutes. You know what I mean? Yeah. They understand that they're telling a story now. They're becoming characters. People are, whether they're booing them or cheering them, whatever the case are, that, that whatever the case may be, they're getting interested in them. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, getting interested in the people, not just what they can do. Right. It's really cool that you have a critical enough lens uh, with still a love for wrestling, though, and like a want for it to be better uh, that you're able to look at it and not just like just bash it. You know, like there's no. a lot of bashing of wrestling these days, but I've always heard you, like I said earlier, such a positive outlook on everything. I, I think a lot of times, too, that there's a small minority out there who are the most vocal mm -hmm. who think that if you critique a, a certain brand, then you're anti them. Yeah, like I've been, I'm, I'm gonna say it. I've been labeled an anti AEW. They think that I dislike AEW and whatever. I don't dislike them. I want them to succeed. I want them to do better. I want TNA to do better. I mm -hmm. want MLW to. Do, I want NWA to do better. I want the whole business to grow. I want everybody that's involved in the business to have an opportunity to work where they want to work and flourish wherever that may be. Yeah. And just because I critique something, it's not to tear down. It's to, in my opinion, hopefully help elevate. Maybe, maybe I could be wrong because the opinions that I always express are mine and mine alone. You may agree, you may disagree, but if you disagree, we could respectfully disagree and still like calling some. You know, people say, "Well, the tribalism thing isn't really a thing." Unfortunately, it is. Yeah. You know, people are picking sides, and I don't like that. It's become politics. I'm voting for this. You're voting for a brand over, you know, I'll, I'll use politics as an example because I don't like to talk a lot of politics, mm -hmm. at least publicly. I, you know, privately, I like to. Of course. Yeah. But 
as I, my wife will tell you, I say this all the time. I don't care what color the, the lawn sign is. I, I want to listen to what the candidate has to say. And if what they say resonates with me, then they'll get my vote. Yeah. And, you know, there's something, some things that the guy on the left will say that, say, that you go, hmm, that kind of makes sense. And the guy on the right will say something that kind of makes sense. And then both sides will say something that make you go, no, that doesn't make sense to me. Mm. So you have to figure it out. It's not about, you know, red and blue and whatever. Yeah. So. And, and as, you know, cliche as it is, you know, we're all, we, we could do, we should uh, disagree, but we're all still the same people at the end of the day. And just like when it comes smaller, like to wrestling, you might choose a different wrestling company, whatever, but we're all still wrestling fans. And that, you know, and that still is a bubble. Like, I, I mean, wrestling is huge right now, bigger than I've seen it in my lifetime. But at the same point, you know, someone walking down the street might know about it, but they're not going to know, like, the intricacies. Like, us wrestling fans are still this kind of really cool uh, bubble, I think, that we should just support each other rather than try to tear each other down. No, that's well said. I, I like the, I like the way you, you express that. And, I, and people got to stop focusing on stuff like, five-star matches and ratings yes. and that kind of stuff yes. because you know that's a that's a business thing the the ratings thing is a business thing and it's the way people absorb wrestling nowadays is a lot different from the attitude era and all that stuff when the numbers when you look at the ratings and you go oh my goodness there were like five million three million people whatever was watching back then and now it's only 2.2 or whatever the case may be people absorb wrestling now in different ways people stream it people it's not just television ratings anymore there's a lot of other variables in play and it's going to be interesting to see how that translates in january when wwe moves a lot of their programming to netflix that's going to be really interesting and i've i mean let alone it being the first time wwe is not going to be on cable right but mm -hmm. Also, the first time I think Netflix is going to have something weekly live. So it's really cool. It's groundbreaking for a lot of different pieces. Right. Um, no, you're absolutely right. And on that same topic, shifting gears to some current wrestling, I know that you contribute after Raw and Dynamite to Wrestling Inc. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you make right now of just the landscape of WWE. Uh, specifically, we see them bringing The Rock back. He's a heel again. That's mm -hmm. awesome um cody rhodes the story they're telling with that the bloodline do you have any thoughts on everything that's happening right now i think they're hitting all the right notes especially i think they had to call an audible oh, with yeah. regards to the rock because when he came back you know he's so beloved automatically they thought everybody would would gravitate to him and they did at first until they assumed he took the wrestlemania main event spot from cody and that's when the people went, oh, no way. We don't like this. And, you know, hats off to them for being able to pivot, call an audible, and go with it. And make it feel like that's the direction they wanted to go in, in the first place. Yeah. Because now people are saying, was it a work? Were they planning to go that way? Did they have to call an audible? Nobody's 100% sure. You could assume that they called an audible. But, hey, who knows? Maybe they did plan to, to go this way. And they're striking a lot of notes that resonate with the audience, not just with that story. That story is big time right now. Yeah. That is probably the best storyline I have seen in I don't know how long, if not ever, that's going on right now. And I know a lot of people are complaining about Cody right now, saying he's looking like a wimp, you know, when he cried that one night and that sort of stuff. And, and he got his butt whipped by Rock on Monday night. And we're seeing a different tone now to WWE. They're not as PG as they used to be, especially oh. The Rock. You know, and when was the last time you saw blood in WWE? And blood like that, too. Like, you know, little things here and there. But that was a, a deep, looked like a deep cut. And um, yeah. in the rain, looked be yeah. like a movie. It was really cool. No, it was awesome. And that's what the thing they understand better than anybody is that when you do something, like when you have the introduction of a, someone bleeding like cody did when you don't do it hardly ever and then when you see it it means something yes it doesn't get lost if somebody's bleeding every week uh you know then it's kind of like oh there he is he's bleeding again ha ah, you know it becomes it almost becomes a running gag is he going to bleed this week yeah you know but when you don't see it you know i think it worked perfectly and i know a lot of people are saying roman reigns is taking a little bit of a back seat but there's still time to 
amp up the volume with him too. You know, I not only do I like to critique and and put stuff over, but at the same time, my fantasy booking wheels the get wheels turning start and I start, turning. Yeah, just like everybody else, like every other fan, and I start thinking, what if this happens? And what? And I like the little Easter eggs they're planting. Oh yes, which is incredible because they've changed their production a little bit. Uh, that one they did the other week where they shot Sami Zayn walking from the ring mm -hmm. and they followed him right through Gorilla into the back that led into that backstage segment. That that's whoever thought of that was just ahead of his game, man. What can yeah. I tell you? And you know, Monday actually we saw a couple of Easter eggs that I liked. Uh there was that the backstage segment with uh, Awesome Truth and New Day and uh, Regeneration X <laughs> Truth <and> Awesome. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and in the background, you see Paul Heyman talking to Drew McIntyre. And Drew's very, a little animated talking to Paul Heyman. And why is he talking to Paul Heyman? I don't know how many people picked up on that, but it, I, you know, I saw that and went, hmm, you know, hey, what's going on here? Yeah. Maybe there's something in play here. And then the beatdown of Cody, I know a lot of people say, well, why didn't Cody fight back? Because the baby face has to overcome adversity. If he's fighting back, there's no adversity. Mm -hmm. let him get his ass whipped this is old school wrestling 101 where the heel just annihilates the baby face and you, you have to, you're anticipating the baby face getting his retribution that's what it's all about it doesn't have to happen immediately i think we're living in an age where people want visual gratification immediately as opposed to waiting for the story to unfold yeah and 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 they miss out on the intellectual story being told if that makes any kind of sense that does it's in the long-term storytelling you need time for something to truly be compelling i feel and mm -hmm. uh, and really make you you know make you feel and be invested on the topic of that uh winding it down one more question about current wrestling you mentioned easter eggs we saw when rock and maybe you were saying this during the beatdown but rock through Cody against um, <clears throat> the wall towards the end in the background you just see John Cena and Stone Cold's face yeah. mm -hmm. do you think we see John Cena I think is probably a given because he has history with Solo I would that's mm -hmm. what I would assume but you think about Stone Cold coming out one last time and giving one last stunner to the rock I don't know it would be very cool what do you think about that it's funny you mentioned that because that's running through my brain right now, too, because I mentioned that on the Wrestling Inc. podcast on Monday night, where when they did that shot on the outside, you see Rock in the rain and on that trailer, that tractor trailer parked at the at the loading dock. Who did you see on the side of that trailer? Was it accidental or was it planted there on purpose? There was Stone Cold Steve Austin and John Cena. So, again, here goes my fantasy booking. Going into night two, it is bloodline rules. Where, which means Rock and Roman win however they do on night one they get past uh, Cody and Seth so it's bloodline rules for night two before the match starts I want this all to happen before the match starts and I'll explain why after I make my explanation Rock comes out followed by Jimmy and Solo they walk down to ringside and they are right away you know that they're there to interfere and cause havoc for Cody and try to help Roman win the title Right there, you hear the music, time to play the game. Ooh. Hunter comes out, Triple H. Now, I know he's probably limit, physically limited to what he can do because of his, his issue he had recently. But who knows? Maybe he could throw a few punches or something. But let him come out to the stage, stand there, stare the rock down, point to him. It's a long way down there. Then point to the entranceway. And then you hear, you can't see me. Ooh. Here comes Cena. Then you... you you know, he takes his other hand. He points his other hand. The glass breaks. Yes. That place will go absolutely ape you know what. You know what I mean? And if they could pull it off, I know there's probably a lot in play in here and probably very little chance it would happen. Can you imagine if Dustin were able to come off, if they just let him come for one night? Uh, I want it so bad. I really do. I saw a tweet right before we did this, actually, um, and it said... Somebody tweeted, just somebody random, oh, you don't know how much I want you to be a part of this story. Roman has all of his bloodline, and um, Cody only has Seth. That's what the tweet said, right. and Dustin retweeted it and said, I'll, I'm more invested than you know, with like a winking face. Who knows? Right. Could just be stirring the pot, but... Yeah, but can you imagine the three guys there? Stone Cold, 
Cena and Dustin come down and they clean house. Mm-hmm. Just the guys at ringside, just the bloodline. Eliminate them from the equation so it'll still be bloodline rules, which could turn into like a hardcore type match and yeah. whatever with the bells and whistles. But Cody and Roman one on one, no interference. Cody, if, if he, I think he needs to go over Roman at WrestleMania. I know that a lot of people are saying no, the, continue the story and let it. I just fear that if they continue the story past WrestleMania, it's going to be hard to keep the people on board the Cody train. Yeah, it's going to be a little more difficult. I think some people will jump off. It's going to be a hard sell. This needs to be done then. And then after Cody pins him and that moment comes and he raises that championship, all those baby faces led by those legends and Hall of Famers come out, celebrate with Cody, lift him on their shoulders. Hmm. And what better way to go out? You know, there it is. And him and his brother hugging and stuff like that. Oh, I can't wait to post this when that does happen yeah. and Jimmy Corderas, the, the future teller, because that would be so mm-hmm. cool. That might him on his shoulders, everything. As you were saying, the people coming out, literally getting chills. Like I, it would be a crazy story told. It really yeah, is. And, and, and this is, this is an exclusive just for you because my wife knows that she's sitting right there. She knows that I, there's two reasons why I have sat, <clears throat> excuse me, serious satellite radio and that's busted open radio. Yep. And seventies on seven. Okay. I, I, I'm just a 70s guy, music, I'm tuned in, I walk around the house, after after Busted Open from 9 to 12, I'm walking around the house, I'm singing to everything, all the words come back to me when I hear the song, I, I think I could sing anyways, <laughs> and I, can you imagine on Monday night, there, because everybody talks about Cody's crying, Yeah, right, we're cry baby, Cody cry baby's been crying and all that sort of stuff, so what happens on Monday night if Cody, I know he won't do it because it's not part of his character, but Instead of we sing along with The Rock, how about uh, a Cody concert? Oh. And he could come out and change the words to one of my favorite songs and say, One rock feeds the fire. Roman <laughs> Reigns lost his title. Cody's champ, so who's crying now? <laughs> or something like that. It, no, it, not something like that. Exactly that. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you for that. I heard you tell a story on a podcast a while ago that I think it was Chuck Palumbo, was it? That yes. With you and I heard you sing your 70s, uh, your 70s no, hit. See, that's why I like driving the car back in the day, because the guy who drove the car to the next town was in charge of the radio. You got to listen to what you wanted to listen to. Yeah. So I, I had a bad habit of smoking back in the day. For, I admit it. Thank God I I. Got gave that up a long time ago. Thanks to yeah. my beautiful wife, helped me uh, kick that habit. Oh, that's nice. But it, for me, it was Marley Lights, Pepsi, and the radio. And unfortunately, thank goodness for the radio because it would drown out Tony Chimmel, who was my <laughs> permanent riding partner all the time. Who we were uh, res- fun, funnily the written nicknamed Waldorf and Stadler. <laughs> but Chuck Palumbo ended up with us in the car one night because he got left behind by the uh, FBI. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was taking he was taking too long in the shower and they just left him there and he said do, do you mind if i ride with you guys to the next town yeah hop in we got room what the hell and me I li- that's me i like to listen to 70s stuff and sing along and once we get to the town and he, he turns chimmel does, does Cordaris know the know the words to every song on the freaking radio he says yeah he pretty much does <laughs> well jimmy this has been such a privilege honestly like just getting a glimpse inside your mind of wrestling, your stories, uh, your fantasy booking wheels, and those nicknames that you just mentioned, because that, that's the chapter I'm on, and many more things can be found in your book, your awesome book. Um, and along with everyone should check out Refin It, um, Refin It Up, of course. Now, see, I'm I'm having trouble getting the words out. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, that's my show's name. Three giant words that everyone <laughs> Rewind, recap, relive. But yes, reffing it up with Jimmy Coderas, Brian Hefner, and RJ. Everyone should get on that. But my final question for you to mm-hmm. uh, sing us out here. this The concept of the show that I usually do is I'll have one legend like yourself on alongside a rising star. So it would be like a rising referee. What would be your advice to a referee just getting into the business? Some crucial advice that you'd give them. Be a sponge always. Always ask. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And always ask for feedback from the veterans in the locker room. That is the best way to learn and advance your skills. 
Excellent. Well said. And again, thank you. You're very kind, by the way. Like this was you're such a great personality. Just give off a very good energy. Thank you so much for well, all. Thank you. Thank you. I it's it's fun. It, like you said, it's my passion. I love talking about it. I I could talk about it all day and drive my my wife crazy with it, but uh, <laughs> God bless her, she puts up with me. So you know. you, and I'll tell you one, yeah. one last thing before we go. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, everybody talks about the sacrifices that the wrestlers make. You know, back in the day when we were doing 250, 300 days a year, and you're away from your family, and they're talking about the sacrifices we make being on the road. But the family also makes sacrifices because we're not there for birthdays, we're not there for anniversaries, we're not there for special occasions and stuff like that so they're the ones who hold the household together while we're out living our dream so it's nice to be able to be home now and give back what i wasn't able to do back then and you know and kind of make amends for it <laughs> yeah if, I, if that makes any kind of sense no absolutely and and you're still able to share your passion through things like like podcasts and everything how long have you been married now you right. know what? Uh, in September will be 25 years. That's incredible. Congratulations to both of you. Well, really. thank you. That's really thank cool. You. And you give me hope because my girlfriend and I, you know, going on a year now and I bite her ear off in terms of wrestling and she couldn't care yeah. any less. So you give me a lot right. of, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, she, my, no, she's not a wrestling. My wife is not a wrestling fan. She's, a, but she puts up with it just for me. Yeah. It's the sweetest thing. But again, thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Rewind, recap, relive. For over 50 episodes, the revolutionary force in wrestling interviews.